All right, hello and welcome. Today is Monday, March 30th, week three of online classes. Uh, we're almost towards, or we're almost getting close to our spring break. Uh, remember, there's no school on Friday. Wait, laptop opening, hee hee. Uh, there's no school on Friday. We are observing Cesar Chavez Day. And then after that, next week is actually our normally scheduled spring AP review time. Uh, which means you do your crack AP questions and all that stuff during uh, next week. Um, however, no no classes, no streams, starting Friday the 3rd. Um, and then we will begin again on the 13th, uh, Monday, uh, for another three weeks of online classes. Uh, currently, our school is slated to be closed until May 1st, and we're hoping to return May 4th. Yeah. So make sure... Uh, your up to date on the calendar. Uh, do your crack AB over uh, over spring break, which is next week, starting Friday. And we have four days of classes this week. All right. So uh, today we want to continue our lecture on induction. How to wake up error three hundred two throwback exception cannot compile. <laughs> what? Uh, how to wake up? I mean, it's eleven. I've made your class as early as possible. My honor students are waking up at 8 a.m. They're such good students. You guys are just terrible. Terrible. You're staying up way too late. Um, all right, anyway, uh, I wanna start off with, uh, with a classic physics problem and then we'll do uh, one more. Uh, this is from extra practice, or sorry, they're not called extra practice anymore. They're called problem sets. <laughs> Problem set one. Problem set one, number seven. So unit eight. Problem set one. Bro, I keep on staying up with Steven on Apex. Stop playing Apex. Uh, senioritis. Just wait. Give me one more month of your best effort, and then you can relax. And then we can potentially even stream it. But one more month. Of, uh, of, of, uh, who is this? A Hebrew Hammer Owl. Okay, welcome, welcome. All right, um, quite diff, diff. Yeah, give me, give me one more month and then, and then we'll stream it. Uh, Sword Hero wants to carry us through Apex Legends, apparently. <laughs> uh, I gave you that last year. <laughs> no, we want the double five this year, we want the ten. The ten, the double star. Uh, it's three in a squad. Oh, oh, really? That's kind of hard then. See, if you have like five people, it's easy to hide and play bad. <laughs> I got carried in league on Friday, and uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we're gonna do number seven. Let's take a look at number seven and problem set number one. This is a, a very good question where we have, uh, a, it's almost like a dial, but it's a, it's, it's like the crust of a pizza. There we go, that's what it is. The crust of a pizza. Imagine the center being over here. Of course, we'll call this one, we'll use color code. Here's green. Green is radius one. And then here's red. Red is radius two. Okay. Uh, ah, that's clever. Stocking up on those channel points. Excellent. All right. The current is going down on the right side, and therefore it will go across to the left, and then up over here, and then across to the right and it circulates. Okay, this is unit eight, problem set one, number seven. A classic, oh, what is CCP? A classic, it should be CPP. There, a classic physics problem. Okay, number seven, problem set one. We have current going around, and and it is asked, what is, well, we call this S, X, 
find uh, sigma b hat x. <laughs> I got this one right, but I feel like I did it a weird way. <laughs> Hmm. All right, so anyway, uh, what we want to find is the net uh, magnetic field at this point. Uh, of course, we're using Biot-Savart law to get there. Uh, let me go and color code uh, green here. The green wire with green radius and the red wire with red radius. Okay. Now, the magnetic field from the sides are zero. Can someone tell us why the magnetic field from the sides are zero? Uh, do, 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 do. Chat, why is it zero? Yeah, that's because um, the wire and the point in question are parallel, and remember that cross product uh, is sine, and so when you're parallel, you get zero. Yep. So all we have to worry about is the individual magnetic field that comes out of the green wire, the green portion, and the red portion. Now you'll see that each little tiny DL, so let's say, let's focus on this piece here. This is the DL, uh, oops, undo, undo, let's use a thinner, there we go, DL. Each little chunk of DL is already perpendicular to the radial radius vector. Okay, the radius and DL, because DL is the arc length. And so we'll use the arc length formula today. Recall that the arc length formula in general case is S equal to R theta, where theta is in radians. Like so. And, uh, and we will sweep across some amount of theta some amount of theta as we go around this arc. Okay, now let's go and use right hand rule number one to figure out the direction at least and make sure uh, they're in the right way. So if I use green, if I curl my, uh, point my thumb to the left, curl my fingers, I can see that green comes out of the page, out of the page. All right, let's do red, red with thumb um, thumb to the right, you have to curl your fingers and then go all the way around. Red gives you into the page. So one of them is out of the page, one of them is into the page, they, they will fight each other. But of course the closer one is going to be stronger and definitely one will win out. Uh, we can say that uh, it is the total. Uh, so my DB is equal to db1 sigma db must be equal to db1 plus db2 and so we're saying plus because that's a general term of course and we'll use the bios of art law here mu naught times i times dl cross r hat over 4 pi r squared um, this is um, the first one, R1, minus, it's minus because the second one is coming, uh, is in the opposite direction. Uh, mu naught I, same current, goes through both, both segments because it's the same wire, DL cross R hat, R2 hat, uh, over 4 pi R2 squared. And we have to integrate them. And uh, let's go and change up the DL cross R hat part. What is this thing? Um, usually it's just, you know, DL sine theta, right? Uh, but we have 100% because um, our, our, um, our DL vector is already 90 degrees to the radial vector. Yeah, but sine of, uh, it's already 90 degrees, so it's um, it's 100% anyway. 
sine of 90 is 1. Uh, so what we get is mu naught i over 4 pi. Okay. And but dl is a function of theta because theta is changing. Theta goes from 0 to theta. Okay. And so in the numerator, we're going to have just the arc length formula. Okay. Um, and what is the arc length formula? Well, it's two pi. Uh, it's proportional to. Sorry. It's proportional to how much my arc length is. Sword hero, refrain from spamming. Oops, caps. Wait, can't we have theta in terms of r? Yeah. Um, so r one. Uh, times d theta over r1 squared. What is the formula for b around a moving charge, please? I saw some conflicting stuff. Uh, we already have that in our notes, remember? Uh, yeah, we already did that one. QB Basically, uh, if you think of velocity as meters per second, uh, meters per second, and then you put charge over seconds is current. And so QV times sine of theta, oh, cross product, uh, so it's QV sine theta. Uh, uh, just to clarify, do you want to see the derivation? Uh, this one here. All right. Uh, I imagine that these segments were just two rings around the center. Uh, that depends. It's R cube. If you use like R hat, you'll get an R cube thing. Um, so you get r cubed in the denominator, and then you have an r hat in the numerator. So that's why. I imagine that these two uh, these segments uh, were just two rings around the center, and used the formula for a solenoid with n equals one. Then I multiplied by theta over three hundred and sixty and got the right answer. Wow. Uh, yeah, they're they're symmetric rings, I suppose, but they're proportional. Uh, All right, so uh, Jacob, uh, yeah, you you'll get an r cubed if you use r hat in the numerator. Uh, we didn't we didn't do r hat in the numerator. We just kept it r squared in the denominator. Uh, all right, so I guess that's about it. And then uh, minus the second one, blah blah. blah. Mm -hmm. And d theta is the same for both. It's from zero to theta. All right, so that should get you to the right answer. Uh, this is just one over R1, and R1 is not changing. So uh, d theta, so integral of d theta from zero to theta is just theta. And then I, I don't actually remember the values for theta and stuff. Uh, I think they're given, right? Uh, 74 degrees, someone said 74, whatever. So you just plug and chug. Make sure you convert theta into radians uh, before you do that. And that should, now you can plug and chug and do it. How do you integrate r and d theta? Uh, r is a constant, so you can just factor it out. Yeah, the radius is constant. That moment when you forget to convert.
All right. Yeah, d theta turns into theta. Because uh, integral of one uh, is whatever the variable is. I didn't see the r on the top. Oh. Yeah, r one of the r ones cancel. All right, so that was number seven. That was a really cool question, uh, a classic physics question, of course. Uh, all righty then. The next one I want to do is is a ring inside a solenoid. Another classic, a classic physics problem. Um, so let's imagine a solenoid. These, uh, if you ever eat like those spaghetti noodles uh, there are some that are just like this a cross-section of um, of a solenoid right anyone know what they're called what kind of spaghetti uh, I don't remember Oops. So imagine having a solenoid, and the length of that solenoid has to be big uh, in comparison to the actual radius. Rigatoni, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what they're called. So we'll have to research that. So we want to make sure that R is much smaller uh, than L. That way it's, it's getting closer to <laughs> spaghetti forgetty. All right. Um, L being the actual length of the solenoid. Okay. And um, I don't know, let's go and use some values, I suppose. Let's say it's 20 centimeters. And R is negligible in comparison. So it's, well, it's big enough to fit. It's big enough. So imagine it keeps on going, right? Do, do, do. Uh, it's big enough to fit a ring in there. And this ring has a radius R2. R2 equal to... Uh, how much should it be this? Uh... Two, uh, I don't know, two, one centimeter in diameter. Let's make it small. It's kind of like the book question, but I'll kind of modify. I'll modify the book question. Okay. Now with our solenoid, you know, let's you know, let's go and send the current in at the top. So into page, into page, into page, and then it curls around. And then, oh no, that's out of page. Out of page, out of page, out of page, and then curls around into, into, into. There we go. 1.0. No, oh, R2 is the radius of this red ring that is inside of our solenoid. Yep, so that's what it is. Uh, and let's say we have about um, 20 centimeters length, right? Let's say we have like a thousand turns for our solenoid. So it has to be huge. And if we know that, it, you know, that we have a really high density of loops per length, then the solenoid will have a nice uniform magnetic field inside of it. So there's B. All right. 
So the question is, find the induced current, vind, if I is equal to, and here's I, uh, we'll start zero at zero. After one second, this is T, this is I in amps. Uh, at one, it is one. At two, it is four. At three, it is nine. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then it stays there for let's how many seconds? Let's just say, you know, for the rest. Yeah, make sure you use SI units, of course, SI. Convert everything to System Internacional. All right, so uh, as you can see, we curve upwards, and then we stay flat, kind of ramp up our, vo our current, and stays flat. Okay, so what is current as a function of time? Can someone give us the equation? Current as a function of time? Yeah. Hey, where's Peterson? Where's Mark? Man. He's been MIA, huh? And also, I noticed how certain students who don't usually show up in class um, showed up for the League of Legends stream. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, current is uh, is T squared. T squared. Oh, no. Uh, wait, you had a little stream. <laughs> uh, all right. So we want to find V induced. Uh, of course, the induction is happening in the ring itself. So we're going to induce uh, a voltage inside based on the force that we will apply onto the charges that exist, forcing a current to produce a magnetic field that will oppose the change in the original magnetic field. Yikes, that's a mouthful. No, no, I'm level three, man. <laughs> I just got carried by Zach. <laughs> Zachary Kadu. Um, and and Josue and, and all them. Yeah, oh, and Adrian Way. Ah, you should you guys know Adrian Way. So Adrian Way was there. You can watch it. It's still uh it's still in the video section if you want. All right, anyway, so let us begin. Uh, we'll go ahead and use Faraday's law, which is the induced voltage is equal to uh, d phi dt, like so. No, Minecraft sucks. Uh, d phi dt, uh, how is the flux changing as a function of time for this ring? Yeah, I mean, I could do a, a variety stream. We'll just go from game to game, I guess. But focus on the physics first. Ah, I don't even have a Nintendo Switch, so can't do that. <laughs> How is phi changing? How is phi changing? All right, number one, uh, we have uh, dB. Area of the loop is not changing, so we'll factor out the area, and then we'll have A times dB dt, and like so. And uh, we know that the magnetic field must be changing because the current is changing at least for the first three seconds. So we'll do it as a piecewise function, piecewise function. 
and um, and we'll go from zero to t to three, and then we'll go from t greater than three. Whoops, t greater than three. Now what happens at three? Something weird happens. It's instantaneous change <laughs> apparently. So let's go and ignore that. Um, there we go. Now, how do I get B? Well, B is the magnetic field inside of a solenoid, inside of a solenoid. And explosion. Yeah, Stephen, you, you you mean Mr. Z Overwatch XD? Oh gosh. <laughs> All right, maybe we'll 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 do one on on Friday or something. Let's plan something on Friday. So for the next four days, I, I need your full attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop showing off. Thank you, Mystery Wizard. B is equal to mu times i o times n. So B inside a solenoid, B sol, is equal to mu naught permeability of free space times i times loops per length. All right? Except our, our our B is changing based on the fact that I is changing, right? So uh, let's go and just write mu naught n over L and then I like so. So this would mean that the induced voltage is a function of it's a function of mu naught times area times n the amount of turns the loops divided by l the length of the solenoid uh, i left the stream to go watch your leak stream and now i want to play leak oh god <laughs> is that capital n or lowercase n where right here this is capital n this is uh so this is current this is number of loops hashtag loops so that was 1000 and this is length of solenoid there you go uh, if you want student just don't type uh focus on what i am saying Ignore, ignore, sword hero. Uh, mu not i. Mu not i times n divided by l, and um, and so the flux, the flux would be mu not times a times n times uh, divided by l times i, but i is changing. I'll just say it's i of the solenoid. And i is changing as a function of time. Uh, so, oops, i of solenoid, so d, i dt, if you will, the rate of change of of um, of current. I should write solenoid here. All right. That was easy. So let's go and factor out all the things that are constants. Yeah, I is a function of time. Uh, let's go and factor out all the constants. So the induced voltage inside our ring must be mu naught times the area of the ring times the number of loops in the solenoid divided by the length of the solenoid times um, the change in current as a function of time. So now we'll go ahead and do this as a piecewise function. Uh, so I'll write di dt here, and we know that di dt is equal to, okay, for the first three seconds, what is it? Zero less than t less than three. What's the function for i? It's not two. Oh, uh, yeah, the derivative. Uh, I as a function of time is T 
squared and i as a function of time is uh, what is it equal to for greater than 3? chat what is i equal i as a function of time equal to when t is greater than 3 hint it is a constant number how many amps? 9 yes 9 amps uh, all right, so here we have the derivative. So from 0 to 3, di dt is equal to 2t. Or we write it as i and then integrate it but you know this is 2t from 0 to 3 and then here the change in current is 0 Sword Hero, please refrain from posting links. Yikes. All right, so now it's just plug and chug. Uh, mu naught is permeability of free space. Four pi e negative seven. A is the area, which is pi times r squared, 0 0.01 squared. It was one centimeter. Uh, d times n, there was a thousand loops. Divide by the length, zero point. No, it was twenty centimeters, so zero point two. Oh. Hmm? Zahert, uh, literally put zahert.exe and stop responding. Responding to what? Your comments? Well, good, because I don't want to respond to your comments. You're talking about games. Ew, numbers. Yeah, well. Uh, and then and then you have to do it two times. Of course, the induced voltage from three seconds and on is zero. Oh, no. It's zero from t greater than three. But what is it here as you're increasing the magnetic, oh, sorry, as you're increasing the current? Unpaired, unpaired parentheses. Where, for my piecewise function? No, this is how you. Act, this is the actual notation. Uh, this is called a braces, by the way. Um, so you do just open braces for your piecewise function. The line above the bottom. I don't know what you mean. What line above the bottom? The numerator, the pi. Oh, this thing. You're triggered by my pi. Pew, pew, pew. Is that better? There we go. There. <laughs> All right. I got you. All right. So anyway, times uh, times your DIDT. What happened to 2t? That's here. Okay, go and crunch it out. Crunch it out. 
we will wait for our chat. Plug in chug now, plug it into your calculator. Uh, of course, we already have the second answer, it's zero volts. Zero volts, but this this first one is not zero volts, it's something. It's something. Maybe I'll just leave it for your quiz then. All right, sounds good to me. <laughs> One point nine seven E negative six, all right. One point one eight E negative five, whoa. Definitely 1.97 E negative 6. What's DIDT? DIDT is for the first one. Oh, sorry. DIDT is 0 for, of course, you know, greater. So that part is easy. It is 2T, but it goes from 0 to 3. Six. I will put a happy pace and then leave this for the next quiz. Inhales. Some of you are plugging in some weird stuff. Ah, VED, cool. Um, I got what Alex got. VED has T in it. So, uh, it is not a constant voltage. Yeah, good job, VED. Uh, it is not a constant voltage uh, because current is changing exponentially. Trust the wizard, my god. Yeah. Oh, trust VED? Who is wizard? I don't know who's wizard is. Um, Oh, I think, oh, was that Alex Frank? It was probably Alex Frank. Uh, mine and Ved's are the same. Okay. I'm going to give Ved credit because he used his name and I know who he is. I don't know who the other two is. I forgot. Uh, the voltage is not constant because the change in current is not a constant value. The change in current is not a constant value. Uh, current is a function of time. Current is function of time. Uh, so you should have a T in your answer. So if I were to rewrite this for the for the second one, of course, is zero. Uh, so you do two T. Okay. So based on what your time is from zero to three, you plug in your time value. Um, and then you can figure out what your voltage is at that point. Right. Um, so if you plug in 2.99, you know, you're going to get something close to 6, uh, and then it's almost 6 times whatever that stuff is in the front. Okay. But as soon as you 
hit three seconds, then your change is stopped, or, or your change is constant, or meaning the change is zero, I should say. The uh, current is constant. Um, and at that point, your induced voltage drops to zero. Verage lull? What? I, I don't know what that is. V E rage? V rage. What are you saying? All right. Anyway, uh, the last thing is to combine everything now, combine everything to get the force of Maxwell equation. We, we just did uh, Faraday's law of induction. Uh, recall that if I had a Q and some sort of stationary Q, stationary, and I wanted to do some work to move this Q closer, Jacob had a stroke. <laughs> uh, if I wanted to do some work to move this thing closer to it, how much work do I do? Uh, well, work would be equal to the integral of force dot whatever this distance uh, that I move. Uh, instead of using x or y or r like we did before, let's go and use l as if it's the l dimension. L dimension. Oh, I do have a, a nice meme for us. Uh, that I have ready since we're so good. Uh, here it is. I don't know, I just found it on the internet. A, a nice Drake meme. Ah, yes, L. That's it. <laughs> you live in the L dimension. Uh. All right, let's use L instead. So the work would be the integral of f dot dl, the dot product of force with the L vector. All right, so now we we can rewrite this. We can rewrite this by dividing both sides by Q. I'm just going to divide this by Q. Go and divide this by Q. So we get work per charge or energy per charge is equal to force per charge, right? Now, energy per charge, if you remember, is the electric, electric potential energy. Okay, energy per charge. So this is actually the voltage difference, which is, sorry, uh, electric potential difference, or voltage, from A to B, of force per charge. Chat, what is force divided by charge? Isn't the right side B? Uh, you mean the left side? Oh, I forgot the equal sign. The left side is B. E, very good, AP1 student. It is E, the electric field dot DL. Huh. Okay. And now we have two equations for V. V is still Vind, right? We have a Vind equation, which is the change in flux per change in time, d phi dt. And we also have a original electric uh, difference in electric potential, and the difference in electric potential is voltage. Therefore, these two must be equal to each other. And here we have Maxwell equation number four, finally. Um, so well, we say that the closed loop integral of E dot DL uh, is equal to is equal to D phi DT. Maxwell's equation number four. Now, what does this mean, really? Let's see if we can find some meaning. Uh, imagine having a magnetic field. So we have B going into the page, right? Of course, we know that if I had a ring, if I had a ring, a wire ring or something, and I changed B, let's say uh, B is decreasing. If B is decreasing, this activates Faraday's law, 
With Lenz's law, I can find the direction, but Faraday's law tells you that a changing magnetic field means that there's a changing flux inside going through this wire, and therefore the wire will fight back, create a magnetic field of its own to oppose the change. If B is decreasing, we need more X's inside of the loop. So we are going to create our own magnetic field that goes into the page because B is decreasing. And in order to do that, there will be a, a current that flows excuse me, clockwise around this loop. Okay. So when the current flows clockwise, we know that we get extra magnetic field going into the loop. And this extra magnetic field will fight the decrease in, uh, in the original magnetic field. So that part is great, right? Now, what the equation number four is telling us is completely something else. It's about space, not forces that we are applying inside this little tiny wire uh, where the changing magnetic field is actually you know, applying a force onto this charge and the charges start moving due to that force. That movement of charge is what we call the current and then the current creates its own magnetic field, blah, 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 blah. That stuff happens, of course, but what this fourth equation tells us is something much deeper in that it defines space. Let's say that, yes, the magnetic field is decreasing, but there is no loop wire. There is no looped wire. Okay. We just have a field that is decreasing in strength. But this equation tells us that when you have a decreasing field, okay, any region in that space, any region in that space, some r distance away, r distance away, will produce an electric field Uh, that is tangent to the circle. Let's try that again. An electric field that is tangent to the circle as if we had a wire in the first place. Right? Now you have to, you have to do a, a quick jog in memory here. Uh, recall that if I had a current carrying wire all right, chat, if you had a current carrying wire and the current is going up, which way is the magnetic field? Mm, right hand rule number one, uh, thumb pointing up, curls around this wire. We know that the magnetic field curls this way. Uh, dots on the left side, X on the right. Okay, that's magnetic field. But for a current carrying wire, what's the direction of the electric field? Because the electric field still exists. We have charges. Yeah. What's the direction of the electric field? Okay. For a current carrying wire, the direction of the electric field is the direction of the current itself. It's within the wire. It exists within the wire. Yes, up. Good job. So here, if we go back, what we're saying is that by having a changing magnetic field, even though you have nothing else, there's no physical wire, there's no metal, there's no charges, you still have a electric field that is basically a circle. Whoa. It's like using the right hand rule, but now your thumb is the magnetic field and the curl of your finger is the electric field. <laughs> this shows you that yes when you have a current carrying wire the current carrying wire creates magnetic fields that loop around the wire itself right but the opposite is also true in that if you have magnetic fields in a straight line right those magnetic field lines will create electric fields that loop around those vectors, just like a current carrying wire 
has looped around magnetic fields. This, these magnetic field lines have looped around electric fields. All right. So this electric field exists even though the current or the wire does not. We have circular electric fields around. Now, why is the electric field in this direction, not the other way? Why is it clockwise and not counterclockwise? That's from Lenz's law, right? That's straight from Lenz's law, in that we have to have uh, we have to have an electric field that will, uh, if it were current, you have to imagine like it's current. If the current was going in the same direction as this electric field, that current would produce magnetic field that goes into the loop. And Lenz's law tells you that it has to be that way to fight the change. Since we have a decreasing amount of B externally, we're going to get a uh, clockwise rotating electric field. Uh, of course, at any distance, so R2 would also have electric field going around. R3 would also have electric field, etc., etc. All right. With that revelation, we're going to end the stream. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, do your problem sets. I'll see you next time. I think there's also mastering physics. Do your mastering physics. See ya.